just one moment now, KDKA, in cooperation with the Pittsburgh Post and Sun, will present the latest presidential election return. November 2nd, 1920. The first big news story into American homes by way of the earphones, the cat's whisker, and the crystal set. I can hear it now. It is now apparent that the Republican ticket of Harding and Coolidge is running well ahead of Cox and Roosevelt. At the present time, Harding has collected more than 16 million votes against some 9 million for the Democrats. We'll give you the state vote in just a moment. But first, we'd like to ask you to let us know if this broadcast is reaching you. Please drop us a card, address station KDKA, Westinghouse, East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is the CHRS Radio News, an audio journal published by and for the members of the California Historical Radio Society, Incorporated, a nonprofit corporation chartered in the state of California and formed to promote the restoration and preservation of early radio and radio broadcasting. Our goal is to provide the opportunity to exchange ideas and information on the history of radio, particularly in the West, with emphasis in areas such as collecting, literature, programs, and restoration of early equipment. Paul Joseph Barbin and Gary Halverson, co-editors. the CHRS. Well, I probably wondered louder than most, so I was appointed president. How do you like our new format? We've gone to an audio format for a number of reasons. For one, it's easier to produce. For most people, it's easier to talk than to write. Also, no other radio club is using an audio format, and after all, radio is an audio medium. Also, we hope it'll be easier for you to participate. All you have to do is say what you want into a tape recorder, and we'll publish it. You don't have to worry about how to spell words, or I will go to the trouble of typing it. But if you prefer, you can write it, and we'll read it for you. We'll have a president's message, restoration hints, interviews, ads, and old programs, and other things of interest to radio collectors. On Wednesday, the 17th of September, at 7.30 p.m., at 969 Addison Street in Palo Alto, a board meeting will be held to determine the fate of CHRS. What will be discussed will be what things CHRS should do and be involved in in the near future. All members are invited to come and participate. I'm willing to do what I can for CHRS, but I can't do it all alone. For instance, I do not possess the journalistic skills necessary to put out a journal. This audio format is easier, but it still takes a lot of work. I do not possess the materials to single-handedly put on an exhibition or display, and I cannot present or preserve by myself the history of the evolution of the electronic industry in the Bay Area. What advantage I do have is that I'm a relatively new member, about two years, and I'm not yet encumbered by the cliques and politics that have existed in the past. Something must be done, for I strongly doubt that the, new, that the one focus of our society, that is the swap meet, will continue to exist. For I doubt that the federal government will allow an historical and educational organization such as ours to exist as a front for a flea market. If many of us each do a little work, much can be accomplished. If not, CHRS will cease to be. Please, come to the meeting. If you're not able to attend, call me or write to me and tell me what you want the society to do for you and what you're willing to do for the society. It would be a pity that our journal's 10th anniversary edition would become our swan song. I'm looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday, the 17th of September. Again, my name is Paul Borbin. My address is 25 Greenview Court, San Francisco, California, 94131. My phone number is 648-8489. Again, my name is Paul Borbin. My address is 25 Greenview Court, San Francisco, California, 
415-648-94131. My phone number is 415-648-8489. Thanks. I'm Gary Halverson, and this is my editorial for the CHRS Journal, Volume 10, Number 2. This edition marks the end of an era. For the past 10 years, CHRS has maintained a quarterly journal as the official vehicle of sharing information, ideas, and history about the early days of radio with you, the society. But times change, and so do people, their interests, lifestyles, technology, and the way things get done. CHRS has been a pioneer in sharing special glimpses into the beginnings of radio. Through them, we can feel a sense of the magic sparked and flamed by the technology that created one of the most profound social transformations this 20th century has experienced. Radio was the communal voice of a culture in change. The new was replacing the old at breakneck speed. It was an age of new social and individual experiences the emancipation of society's weaker half, electric lights, the First World War, the First National Economic Depression, Prohibition, moving pictures, flying machines and Victrolas. We feel that the quality of these experiences we seek to share have been a hallmark of the content of our journals. That's one of the reasons for this new format. Through it, we can provide the next best thing to the real McCoy. So far, the reaction to this format has been extremely positive. New ideas, more membership contribution, shorter production times, and even a few attaboys. Anyway, what you're about to hear is an interview or a segment of an interview with Dr. Leedy Forrest shortly before his death. A special thanks to the Perham Foundation for sharing it with us. Every year, when we... Uh open our radio classes, we always start off by telling the story of how voice broadcasting began. And I know the students would much prefer to hear it from your standpoint, how you recall that episode, the first successful voice transmission. Well, <clears throat> long before I was able to transmit the voice through the air, I uh, was resolved on <clears throat> the great possibilities of such a development. Broadcasting uh, appealed to me long before there was such a thing available. And my uh, prime idea in developing the uh, radio phone was to uh, give it broad, give the uh, devoted to broadcasting music and uh, educational programs over wide areas from a central transmitter. Of course, I had in mind also the point-to-point -point use of the radio telephone, especially from ship to shore and from ship to ship. But uh, the thing that appealed to me even more strongly than that purpose was the idea of reaching masses of people by means of this new medium. and. Uh, from the beginning of 1907, when I was first able to transmit my voice and phonograph music broadcast from my laboratory in New York, I uh, worked uh, to develop 
that phase of the radio telephone. At that time, uh, very few indeed had any conception of the, the possibilities of broadcasting. Those to whom I spoke, radio or electrical engineers, thought only of the point-to-point -point service. I remember distinctly that when I went to visit some of my classmates in order to enlist their financial aid in my development work and explain to them that uh, the device was not use useful in the cities where there's a large number of telephone conversations to be carried on, that, that the interferences would limit us perhaps to a dozen or twenty transmissions in the same zone, they uh, said, well, what possible use is a thing if you can't replace the telephone by it? They could not see the advantage of broadcasting. And uh, it was not long, however, after I began to broadcast that the radio amateurs who were around the, the neighborhood began to hear voices and music over their receivers instead of what they always heard before, dots and dashes of the Morse code, became very enthusiastic about it. And it spread among that uh, fraternity very fast indeed. That's the prelude. Now we sing. When the sun goes down, the tide goes out, the darkies gather round and they all begin to shout. Hey, hey, Uncle Doug. Oh, you old Uncle Doug down on home there with his feet in his mud. I don't mean Uncle Doug's pappy and his feet's really in the mud. And what a dance do they do. Lordy, how I'm telling you, they don't need no band. Uh, say, Doc. What is it, Bill? Do you think I'll live to be a hundred years old? Well, I don't know. Let me see. Do you smoke? No. Do you drink? No. Do you stay out late at night? No, sir. Do you run around with the flapper? I should say not. Well, what in the world do you want to live to be a hundred years old for? Well, Lindbergh is coming down as a gang fan. Here's the boy. He comes forward. Unassuming. Quiet, very serious, and awfully nice. And now the National Broadcasting Company and Associated Radio Stations are going to ask you to just listen because particularly this is the first time band music or music has been transmitted from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast, which is another epoch. We will listen to the band. Hello? Yes, this is Eddie Cantor. The maternity ward. Ida what? Okay, I'll be right over. Why doesn't somebody tell me these things? <laughs> <laughs> now, Snooks, tell me, what do you have to do for homework today? A composition. You have to write a composition on what? On um, how I spent the day at home. Why, it's a blank sheet of paper with nothing on it. All day. <laughs> the manufacturers of radio receivers would be the ones who would profit by the widespread popularity of the broadcasting idea, and uh, we would get our revenues largely from that source. I did not think very much of the advertising idea, 
and uh, deplored very strongly the commercialization of our programs when that uh, operation began in 1920. But uh, it, was, it was soon evident that here was an une unexpected and unrivaled opportunity for advertising and uh, obtaining large financial support for the broadcasting stations. Many times since, since this uh, period you indicate, you've been very outspoken on uh, your ideas concerning the uses of your invention and more particularly I think the misuses of radio broadcasting. Have you already indicated advertising? Now uh, to what extent also do you think radio has been abused in its development? Well, aside from the advertising, the commercialization of the programs, which is vastly overdone from, from the very beginning, I deplored the uh, program contact content of so many of the programs. Instead of uh, being devoted to uh, cultural and educational purposes and a better class of music, they uh, rather sought the, to de develop the popular idea of uh, jazz, boogie-woogie, music, and uh, the vaudeville type of radio entertainment. Now that <coughs> was uh, another s source of great disappointment to me, that uh, the program content was so debased so the vast majority of the programs became moronic. I always maintained that the programs could be made just as popular and still have an uplifting tendency or influence. But that uh, idea was, was not accepted by a majority of the program sponsors. years now that stations have been putting on programs full-time. Uh, what hope do you see that programs may improve? Uh, we've already discounted in our earlier discussion the possibility of a complete government subsidy 
but should we expect the commercial stations with their big audiences to assume more responsibility for cultural programs, or should we look to uh, full-time educational or, or full-time cultural stations? I think that <clears throat> it's a slow process of education. Mass education is always a slow process, but uh, there is progress in that direction, and uh, with uh, a larger proportion of, of high-grade programs, you will find the, very slowly the demand for such <clears throat> will increase. I think that uh, many of the now well-known uh, symphony orchestras would uh, not be in existence had it not been for the uh, gradual training of uh, the public to appreciate the kind of music that those symphony orchestras play. And uh, the radio is, is largely responsible for that gradual improvement in the musical tastes of the American public. There's a vast amount of work yet to be done, but uh, that, that reform is really underway. Well then, taking the new trend now, the television that is now developing and expanding at such a tremendous rate, as we actually are beginning at the start of this new medium, can we apply to it the, uh, the lessons we've learned from the development of radio as far as educational or cultural programming is concerned? Can we avoid any mistakes we made earlier? It appears, at least on the surface now, that television is going to develop exactly as radio did as far as programming is concerned. What can we do now before it gets too far ahead of us? Too, too much imitation of radio programs is already evident in the quality of our television programs. Too many radio, too many television stations are owned by radio owners of radio transmitters and it's quite natural that they follow the same pattern. <clears throat> they uh, ignore the uh, vastly improved opportunities, opportunities for cu cultural programs made available by video. But uh, so long as the uh, main purpose of television seems to be to earn the last possible dollar from the programs, we find what we see today. So many programs are very uh, ordinary quality, developed with a minimum of, of expense, amateur hours, amateur talent, and amateur music. The uh, television possesses an unmatched power for uh, implanting in the minds of the viewers a uh, desire for uh, interesting and uplifting and educational topics. And it's a sad fact that uh, the desire for uh, obtaining a maximum revenue in the shortest possible time impels the program directors to emphasize the uh, amateur talent, which it costs them very little, and uh, the bulk of the programs, where they're not uh, criminal, are, uh, is in fact devoted to very ordinary topics, where they pay large sums, of course, for well-known uh, comedians, and, but the general tendency of the television program today is to amuse, entertain, and not to uh, instruct or educate. I'm very hopeful that uh, the uh, that the movement now on foot is quite evident with the FCC commissioners to give television a stated amount of educational time will result in a gradual 
improvement in the television programs. I'm sure that if, uh, say, 10% of good television hours were uh, restricted to educational and uh, cultural programs, the effect on the American mind would become very evident in a very few years. What about color, Dr. DeForest? What about this? I know you are very strong for the RCA system. Do you think there's any possibility at the FCC? I, I was amazed that the FCC should come to such an unrealistic decision as they did. It's perfectly apparent to anyone who's acquainted with the technique and the techno technological factors involved, as well as the uh, sociologic factors involved, that an, an incompatible television, color television system is absolutely wrong. And so long as there is a compatible television system existent or in, in prospect of uh, perfection, there is no excuse whatever for authorizing the incompatible mechanical system. Oh, tell me, tell me, doctor, what can be wrong with me? Say, have you got a headache or water on the knee? Well, someone said I'm full of prunes, that's why I'm sad and blue. Say, here's the only remedy. Please tell me what to do. Why, oranges, even more oranges. From can I all my age? I don't know. I'll get myself a sun-kissed maiden. And I'll bet you like her orange maiden. Oh, the fruit of the old apple tree. Here's a lot of apple sauce today. Say, why oranges eat more oranges? From can I all my age? Say, Bill, you know. As you know, the 19th century, among other things, is notable for the so-called Industrial Revolution. The invention of steam, of the power loom, of electricity, of mass production machinery, clearly indicated that society was on the threshold of overcoming the enemies of want and insecurity. So I went in the closet to get the, the card table, and when I was in there, I happened to see three or four of them quarantine cards with scarlet fever written on them in your closet. Well, now, Amos, just a minute. Uh, lock the door, lock the door. We got him. Yeah, lock. when you get out of here, you're going to have worse than scarlet yeah, fever. No, lock the door. Lock the door, King. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Rudy. Oh, Joe, how are you? You want to buy a duck? No, Joe, I don't want to buy a duck. Why? Why? Because. Well, uh, maybe your brother would like to have one, huh? I haven't a brother. Uh, well, if you had one, you think he'd consider it? No. Under no circumstances? Under no circumstances. You nasty man! I was, uh, suffering from swollen thighs. <laughs> Sitting down too much, I suppose. They made a mistake and brought me camper balls instead. Did you swallow them? Yeah, and every time I sneeze, dozens of moths fly out. What? Yeah, a covey of moths closely followed by a bevy of silverfish. A bevy? Flying in V formation. <laughs> Light fly on the wing. Hey, Bill, Here's a Bill, sign Bill, of now look, wait a minute. When the little Bill, children... Bill, now look, hold it, now hold everything. Please, oh, sir, you won't believe this, but Bing, down there in the water was the sweetest little trout you ever saw. What's that got to do with you hearing my singing? Well, sir, Bing, this little fish was sticking his little head right up out of the water. You know how fish do. Mm -hmm. Just kind of blowing bubbles and going boo 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 at me. <laughs> I, want, I want to tell you, Bing, I pert near cried. <laughs> yeah, sir. He wagged his little tail at me and he said boo 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 until I just had to take it with me. Mm. And all the way back to camp and all night long, he just kept wagging his tail and saying boo 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 at me boo -boo -boo. until there was only one thing left for me to do. You brought him here. No, no, I ate him for breakfast. <laughs> well, that certainly should have put a stop to his a boo 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 eh? 
No, sir, Bing, it didn't. He continued to boo boo Yes, sir, once before I ate him and twice after. <laughs> this is the end of side one. Please turn the tape over at this time.